Chapter 17, Gilded Age Politics and Immigration. Guiding Questions. How did the American political system and mass democracy develop in the industrial era? How did party politics flourish in this era? How did federal immigration policy develop in the late 19th century? Why did so many immigrants come to the United States? How did the immigrants build civil and religious institutions in the places they lived and what obstacles did they face in America? Issues. Impact of party politics on democracy in industrial era. The development of party politics and third parties in the Gilded Age. Transformation of American society and institutions through mass immigration from Europe. The political culture of the Gilded Age, the name Mark Twain gave to the late 19th century for its worship of wealth, has long been seen as an era of corruption. It featured unfettered laissez-faire capitalism, where the unequal distribution of wealth between the rich and the poor, and the control of politics by the special and corporate interests was at its peak. While accurate in some respects, it created a large middle class, prosperous city commerce, and new economic opportunities for large numbers of Americans. The national economy in this period experienced growth and depression and high levels of unemployment followed by unemployment. The new technology of electricity introduced electric lights, telephones, electric streetcars, and an array of household devices. This was also a gaudy democratic age in which political parties competed for votes and exerted influence with a wide array of constituents. Politicians conveyed partisan messages in newspapers, parades, political rallies and parades, and party conventions. This was also an age of civic activism, as women's groups and temperance movements, as well as anti-immigration, socialists and anarchist clubs, and religious organizations were formed. Civic activism abounded on the local, state, and national levels. The Civil War established a two-party system built around the Democratic and Republican parties. A number of small parties emerged in the aftermath of the Civil War, including the Prohibition Party, Socialist Labor Party, Populist Party, and the Greenback Party, among others. The Populist Party proved to be the most successful, winning election to state legislatures, governorships, and Congress, and fielding presidential candidates, but it proved short-lived. It was ultimately absorbed into the Democratic Party in the 1896 presidential election. Although corporations and business interests exerted great influence in American politics, and political corruption was evident in machine politics, in which party bosses controlled votes, political appointments, and government contracts, democracy still flourished. The perception of political corruption marked the contested presidential election of 1876. This election was decided by a specially established 15-member electoral commission composed of seven Republicans, seven Democrats, and one swing vote charged with inspecting contested electoral votes in Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio was awarded the presidency by a single vote of eight seven. In return, Hayes promised to serve one term, and as a consequence, federal troops were withdrawn from southern states. This corrupt bargain was more implied than proven, but it reflected the perception of crass politicking after the corruption within the administration of Ulysses S. Grant. The Republican Party, exploiting its leverage in large population states in the North and New England, was flush with money from big business interests. By using the Civil War as the basis for recruiting members to the Grand Army of the Republic, a powerful veterans organization in the Northern states, the Republican Party, the majority party in the generation from the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 through the election of William McKinley in 1896. In those years, only one Democrat, New Yorker Grover Cleveland, won the presidency. Cleveland split his two terms, first defeating James G. Blaine in 1884, and then losing a re-election campaign to Benjamin Harrison in 1888, before winning back the office four years later. American politics in the late 19th century reflected strong religious and ethnic, as well as regional, divisions. Americans remained an intensely religious people. Loyalty to one's religion and church affected how many Americans voted. 
Much like the early 19th century, Americans experienced waves of religious revivals that swept urban and rural areas. Americans displayed strong ethnic identities, usually tied to religious affiliation. Germans, Irish, English, Welsh, Scandinavians, Poles, and other ethnic groups prided themselves on their ethnic heritage, as displayed in community centers, immigrant aid societies, fraternal organizations, parades, and various other activities. Religious and ethnic divisions were minimalized, however, by a great pride in being Americans and living in a country of immigrants and a nation that allowed people of different faiths to worship in freedom. The Republicans were the party of the North, big business, and reform-minded Protestants, including Methodists, Lutherans, and Episcopalians. Republicans supported protective tariffs for both revenue and protection of American industry. Revenues from tariffs, or a tax on imported goods, were the largest source of federal revenue before the creation of the income tax in the early 20th century. Prior to the ratification of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution in 1913, the federal income tax had been ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. The Republicans were the party of economic development, providing land grants for railroads, and promoting the gold standard as a stable currency for business. Their main constituents were Northern businessmen, Protestants, African Americans, and Union veterans. Many Midwestern farmers also voted Republican due to divisions over ethnocultural issues, immigration and drinking were especially contentious issues, and they waved the bloody shirt, reminding voters in the North of the Civil War, inducing loyalty to the Republican cause. The Democrat Party was Southern-dominated, rural, and states' rights-oriented, much like the party had been since its formation in the 1820s. Democrats drew some strength in the northern cities. As the pro-slavery party before the Civil War, the Democrats continued to enforce white man's democracy in the South. They rolled back the Reconstruction-era gains of blacks by imposing segregation, restricting the black vote, and forcing black farmers into a tenant relationship with white landowners. The Ku Klux Klan was the military arm of the Democratic Party in the South, enforcing the racial separation which grew in intensity in the region in the late 19th century. The Democrats were also strong in some urban areas, with the state of New York dominated by a political machine known as Tammany Hall. New York City, growing in importance as an international trade and financial center by the late 19th century and flush with recent immigrants from Ireland, Italy, and Eastern Europe proved to be an important recruiting ground for new voters who would be paid to vote for the Tammany machine. In the 1860s, the machine faced a scandal when James Marcy, boss, Tweed, ran a corruption racket so large that it bilked New York taxpayers of millions of dollars for inflated construction contracts on city buildings. Broken up by prosecutor Samuel, Samuel Tilden, who would go on to win the Democrat presidential nomination in 1876, the Tweed Rings graft forever stained the party machine with corruption and greed. However, by the late 19th century, the Tammany machine was not only a vote producer, but also served as a social service organization for new immigrants. In exchange for their vote, Tammany would provide aid during hard economic times, patronage jobs in urban government, and escape for their children to camps outside of New York during the hot summer months. The machine grew in power in New York and controlled the state's politics and the Democratic Party well into the 20th century. The saloon became the center for boss controlled politics in the cities. For temperance reformers who wanted to restrict the sale of alcohol, the saloon became the symbol of moral and political corruption in America. The working man's saloon, a haven for the immigrant worker, provided a place where he could get a hot meal, provided he brought, bought a drink, meet with friends, and talk to the boss about a job. For the politician, the saloon became an office, a place to recruit workers, and a place to buy people's votes and get them to the polls. At election time, the ward healer, an individual who canvassed votes for a political party, working for an urban machine, was as ever-present at the saloon as whiskey. American politics was a rough business. Ohio Congressman Clement Vallandigham called politics war without the bayonets. 
parties to use military-style campaigns to mobilize voters, suggestive of the fight to the finish for electoral victory. Money proved to be especially important for political success. The 1896 Republican presidential campaign of William McKinley raised over $2 million. Substantial sums came from industrialists and bankers like John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, all aimed at defeating the upstart Democratic candidate William Jennings Bryan, who raised a paltry $250,000 in comparison. The Senate became a millionaire's club of wealthy figures who could buy elections and who represented the interests of the business class. Political violence also became normalized in this period. Of the four American presidents assassinated in office, three were killed in the period from 1865 to 1901. Abraham Lincoln was killed by a conspiracy of Southerners in April 1865. James Garfield was stalked by a madman, Charles Guiteau, who shot him in Washington as he waited to board a train trying to escape the patronage seekers who were looking for government jobs. He succumbed to his wounds several months later. William McKinley, who had been re-elected easily in 1900, was assassinated by an anarchist named Leon Solgott in Buffalo, New York in July 1901 after opening the Pan-American Exposition. The growth of anarchism, the belief that working people could run their own affairs without government, grew in the late 19th century as frustrated workers seized on the ideology to justify revolution against the political order. Government and the judicial branch took a dim view of anarchism, blaming it for the violent railroad strike of 1877. They also blamed German anarchists in Chicago for throwing a bomb at Haymarket Square in Chicago on May 4, 1886, which led to the deaths of seven police officers and four citizens. German anarchists in Chicago were charged with conspiracy, with seven sentenced to death and 15 to long imprisonment. Anarchism remained a belief system fed by intellectuals rather than workers, and the public view of its equation with Marxism never reached levels of popular support in the United States. For the vast majority of American workers, Marxist radicalism never had much support. Workers sought better working conditions, an eight-hour day in a cooperative commonwealth rather than revolution. Workers accepted the tenets of the American dream, that through hard work they could rise, and they expected their children to do better than them. The popular books of Horatio Alger sold widely to young boys who read about orphans, bootblacks, and impoverished youngsters who, through perseverance, ambition, and strong religious belief, and often good luck, made their way out of poverty and into the mainstream of American opportunity. Alger's boys avoided the traps of gambling, vice, and drinking, that laid so many low in this period. They exemplified the message of hard work and clean living, which would pay off for those who followed the model Alger preached. For those workers disenchanted with working conditions, labor unions were one alternative to provide redress for bad working conditions and low pay. Illegal under American law, unions formed anyway with the Knights of Labor, led by Terence Powderly and the American Federation of Labor. Following a broken railroad strike in the mid-1880s, the Knights declined thereafter. The AFL, headed by an English-Jewish immigrant, Samuel Gompers, would reach one million votes by 1900. Gompers and the AFL supported immigration restriction. The AFL feared that immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe were driving down wages for American workers. The AFL opposed aligning organized labor with a single labor party, or with either the Republican or Democratic parties. The new immigration to America, which rose in importance from the 1880s until it was cut off by federal law in the 1920s, represented the second largest period of immigration in the nation's history, only surpassed by the period from 1965 to the present. More than 40 million people, mostly Europeans, came to the United States during this time. The vast majority were from Southern Europe, Italy and Greece, and Eastern Europe, Poles, Russians, Jews, and Slavic peoples from Austria-Hungary. The traditional immigrants from Germany, Scandinavia, Ireland, and England had dissipated by this time, 
replaced by newcomers with strange languages, customs, and religious practices. The majority of immigrants were Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and Jews, which led native-born white Protestants to limit and hinder the advancement of these immigrants in a variety of ways, from banning Catholic teachers in public schools to fighting for laws to prevent the Catholic Church from becoming a dominant institution in American life. The immigrants came for many reasons. They were pushed out of their homelands by declining opportunities. Many had been small farmers, and the limitations on land in many parts of Eastern Europe led them to seek work elsewhere. In Russia and Austria-Hungary, the military draft led many young men to escape. Military service could last a lifetime. Jewish immigrants from Russia, confined to a pale of settlement in Poland, then part of the Russian Empire, faced religious discrimination and pogroms, organized violence, against their communities. Economic hardship and the lack of economic opportunity in Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Poland caused immigrants to seek new opportunities and freedom in the United States. What lured immigrants to America was the opportunity for work and for the economic success which they heard about from earlier immigrants in letters written to family members. In America, I heard the streets were paved with gold, one Italian saying went. When I came here, I learned three things. First, the streets weren't paved, paved with gold. Second, the streets weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. No matter, the lure of economic opportunity in the cities and factories of industrial America proved hard to resist. Italian immigrants flooded into cities, working in factories, steel mills, mines, and on railroads. Similar work awaited Eastern Europeans in the meatpacking houses of Chicago, the steel mills of Pittsburgh, and factories in other cities. Jewish immigrants came to New York City and established themselves in the textile putting out system, where garments were manufactured in small batches and tenements, thriving on the Lower East Side of the city. Religious discrimination grew as immigrants built their own Catholic churches, Jewish synagogues, and Orthodox churches in the cities of America. While nativists fought these immigrants, establishing groups such as the American Protective League, there was little overt anti-Semitism against Jews like that which existed in Russia. The APL, however, was fanatically anti-Catholic, publishing scurrilous tracts about Catholic priests and spreading stories of Catholic nuns who kidnapped Protestant children in order to turn them into Catholics. They prevented the rise of Catholics into professional occupations and into colleges and schools, but that did not dent the migration of millions of Catholics into the urban areas of the North and Midwest who built their own parochial schools and founded their own colleges to educate their young in their own faith. American immigration policy was generally unrestricted until the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. From that time forward, the national government took an active role in creating an immigrant policy which eschewed paupers, criminals, mentally defective people, and others who might become a public expense. Major immigration entry ports included New Orleans, where many Germans migrated, flocking into the upper Midwest after the Civil War, Baltimore, San Francisco, and New York. In 1891, seeing the need to concentrate immigration at a central place, the federal government opened Ellis Island in New York Harbor as the central embarkation point for immigrants from Europe. Federal officials supervised the immigrants, processing them and inspecting them for health concerns, checking on their pass-through interviews, and screening them for a growing list of concerns from polygamy to sex crimes to disease, which could bar their entry. Saying you had a job waiting for you was grounds for removal, so Italian immigrants devised the padrone system, whereby an Italian would claim the newcomer as a cousin or relative. The federal officials were poorly paid and often indifferent to the treatment of the newcomers, but did a heroic job in supervising the migration of millions of immigrants through Ellis Island. Shipping companies bringing immigrants from Europe were responsible for checking the backgrounds of immigrants. If they brought someone over who was not welcome, a list which grew to include anarchists and other radicals, they would be charged with shipping the migrant back home, an incentive to make sure they brought only acceptable migrants to the new world. Once here, immigrants built their own institutions and created their own social service agencies. 
from the German Turnverein to the Catholic Holy Name Societies, to help in the adjustment to a new life. During recessions, the society served as social service organizations to help the unemployed, broken families, and to promote the concerns of their communities. Without a welfare state to do so, these organizations thrived on community and financial support from immigrant businesses and industrialists to provide the services lacking from the federal government. As support for public education grew and child labor ended in many industries, the children of immigrants attended public schools and were Americanized, often learning English before their parents. They frequently established themselves as a prominent ethnic voting bloc in major cities. Earlier immigrants, like the Irish, who were heavily discriminated against by Protestant majorities, became active in politics and in urban professions such as firemen and policemen. In many cities, Irish politicians assured the rise of Irish Catholics to predominant influence in the city. These included John Fitzpatrick, or Honey Fitz, the grandfather of President John F. Kennedy, who became mayor of Boston in 1905. Immigrants continued their involvement in politics. In 1884, after Republican presidential candidate James G. Blaine proclaimed the Democratic Party as the party of rum-drinking, Romanism, and rebellion, Democrats marshaled the urban ethnic vote. Democratic candidate Grover Cleveland mobilized the, those constituents to win the White House, the first Democrat to do so since James Buchanan in 1856. This was in spite of rumors brandished by the GOP that the bachelor Cleveland had fathered a child out of wedlock. Ma, ma, where's my pa? was a line employed against Cleveland. Gone to the White House, ha, 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 was the answer after Cleveland won. Anti-immigrant sentiment never dominated American electoral politics in the late 19th century. One issue which did combine hostility to immigration with politics was temperance a reform movement which had its roots in the early 19th century and which led to the formation of an organization known as the Women's Christian Temperance Union led by Frances Willard. A middle-class housewife and mother, Willard and other Protestant reformers were alarmed at the power of the drinking establishment in America. They sought to use their influence to promote a temperance campaign to limit consumption of alcohol. Through women's committees in the major parties, the WCTU tried to influence the crusade against drinking, combined with an effort to Americanize the immigrant and him or her, and make him or her less dependent on demon rum. A prohibition party formed in 1869 fought alcohol and sought to make the sale and manufacture of alcohol illegal. It received more than 250,000 votes for its presidential candidates in 1888 and 1892. Both the Prohibition Party and the Women's Christian Temperance Union reflected the concerns of Protestant Americans, many of them Baptists or Methodists, about immigrants and their drinking. They sought to reform the conditions which they saw as the basis for poverty, child abuse, and family breakdown. The Great Plains may have been the last place one would have looked to find the beginnings of a political reform period which would stretch from the 1880s to the 1920s, but the reform era in America began with a crusade of impoverished farmers battling against powerful economic interests, the banks and the railroads, and the Midwestern and Southern Plains. The National Farmers Alliance movement adopted political and economic reforms and founded a new political party the People's Party, or Populist Party, in 1892 in Omaha, Nebraska. It tried to return political power to the people and to limit the influence of the privileged class in order to bring about major changes in the functioning of the economy and of politics. The nation is on the verge of moral and political ruin, wrote Ignatius Donnelly, author of the Omaha Platform. The party called for a national income tax, direct election of U.S. Senators, nationalization of railroads, and for women's suffrage. It also called for currency reform and the creation of a banking system in rural America to alleviate the debt of farmers and provide for inflation of the currency. It was this later issue which derailed the impressive, yet radical, reform program of the party. In 1892, the populists were hopeful as their presidential candidate, former Civil War General James Weaver, received a million votes. A financial panic in 1893 
which culminated in the worst economic depression in American history to that time, lasted four years. With estimates of as many as 20% unemployed, it should have promoted the populist calls for reform even more. But by 1896, the party had focused only on a single issue cause, inflation of the currency through the restoration of free silver coinage. This involved the right to have your silver coin for free by the U.S. Mint, a privilege which had been taken away in 1873. Inflation would make the value of debt less and help strap farmers suffering from low commodity prices. The populace fell prey to the conspiratorial vision of William Hope Harvey's Coins Financial School, a pamphlet focusing attention on the evils of the banking system and how the system was rigged against the people. With a focus on currency, the populace nominated the crusading boy orator of the Platte River Valley, Nebraskan William Jennings Bryan, who won the Democratic presidential nomination in Chicago through his powerful Cross of Gold speech. Bryan, a deeply religious evangelical Christian, was a journalist covering the convention, but had been recruited to give the speech by free silver advocates before the convention. His speech, with its religious allusions to Christ and the crown of thorns, ignited the convention and led to Bryan's nomination. It also led him to become a dominant figure in the Democratic Party for a generation. The populace fused their party with the Democrat nominee at their convention, accepting Bryan as the populist standard bearer a month later. The Republican candidate, William McKinley, won easily, raising huge amounts of money and running on a stable currency backed by a gold standard passed by Congress in 1900. Bryan campaigned all over the country, giving a variation of the Cross of Gold speech everywhere he traveled, but it was for naught. With Bryan's defeat, the populists were defeated as well. While the party still fielded candidates after 1896, its luster faded as the restoration of high prices and the end of the Depression allowed farmers real prosperity and ended their reform zeal. Elections were popular affairs, and in spite of voting irregularities and impediments to voting, such as growing discrimination against blacks and women not being allowed to vote, popular participation was never higher. More than 80% of the eligible electorate voted in presidential elections, with 1896 reaching the unheard of, before or since, rate of 94% participation. Political parties had the ability to produce excitement and turnout, and the parties were able to get strong showings of their constituent groups at election time. The late 19th century was the last time in which party politics was as strong in the nation's history. Reform movements, the development of party primaries, and changing voter laws intended to produce greater democracy instead lowered turnout after the turn of the century. In the late 19th century, parties showcased what Alexis de Tocqueville noticed in the 1830s, that strong voter participation and mass democracy was, for all its faults, a showpiece of American character.